good evening it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker sushma senior director cisco usa to this webinar so now it is 10 o'clock 10 pm for sushma uh, i welcome sushma i welcome dr gopal krishna dynamic leader eminent academician director nagarjuna education society to this webinar i also welcome dr shrikanta murthy principal dr p harisha vice principal dr jitendra mungara dean academics nct to this webinar i also welcome all the participants to this webinar i request uh, dr gopal krishna sir to say few words about this event so over to you sir yeah uh, thank you uh, madam rajeshwari hegde now uh, first of all i should congratulate uh, both of you rajeshwari hegde and dr mamta for having taken this initiative at this point of time and uh, i should thank uh, madam sushma shrikant for having accepted your invitation and joined for this webinar and conducting this webinar thank you madam sushma uh, coming to the topic of the day disaggregation i was thinking aggregation we know it is joining or bringing together many of these things the word there one more technical word is networking networking also leads to the joining of items or things or in the uh, computer uh, norms if we say there was physical networking earlier and now uh, many of these things have turned to wireless networking and things like that cisco is a leader uh, in all these areas so disintegration disaggregation see this is something new how do you disaggregate aggregation is joining together disaggregation of the hardware and software mean there should be some kind of a separation between the hardware and the software i am very happy that uh, a topic of this nature has been selected for this uh, uh, webinar and uh, i wish this webinar all the best and uh, may all the students have the benefit of this uh, uh, sushma madam at this point of time see it is evening uh, or uh, night uh, 10 o'clock for you and at this point of time you have joined for this webinar and you have agreed to conduct this webinar this is something which is interesting this shows the interest that you have in spreading the knowledge this is something which we all should appreciate uh thank you again uh, for your uh, initiation in this and i hope this webinar will benefit to the students and the faculty particularly at this point of time the uh, covid 19 time uh thank you very much for inviting me to have uh, one or two sentences here and i wish this event all the success thank you very much I request our student Rahul to introduce the speaker. So over to you, Rahul. Uh, good morning, everyone. So this is Rahul, and I will be introducing our uh, beloved speaker, Sushma. Uh, Sushma, ma'am. Uh, Sushma is an active, action-oriented executive with strategic, strategic thinking, and has extensive experience in end-to-end -end product development. She has a breadth of in experience in embedded and application software development. with record of customer focus sushma has experience in various technologies such as security mobility cellular networking protocols building enterprise or great applications distributed systems cloud technologies devops ci cd she holds a us patent in adaptive handling of pulse train signals in a voice keep sushma has co-authored rfcs sushma is a passionable and passionate uh, personable leader with a positive attitude and a strong team following and has led a large scale organizations and turnkey solutions so that's a very good organization about uh, intro about our speaker over to you sushma ma'am thank you rahul i think she is muted Rajeshwari ha okay can you hear me uh, i couldn't unmute myself can you unmute me yes yes okay so i'm trying to see how to share the uh, video here can you guys hear me right yes yes yeah so i'm trying to see how to 
uh, for some reason the video uh, sorry excuse me one second i'm not able to see how to share the screen here just one sec uh, it says no channel contacts later no later um view um show manage participants okay i think just let me just share one second give me i think uh, the, I'm unable to share right now. Do you need to give me some kind of a Dr. Message? Mamta, I got it. can I somebody got it. help her out uh, in the no, screen it. sharing? I got it. I got it. You got it. Yeah. We have done trial yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Can you see the yes. can you see the screen? Yes, madam, we can see that. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll open this. Can you see it? Yes, nothing okay. is possible as we are able yes. to see that. Yes, okay, good. So we are, we are in business then, thank you. Uh, sorry for the little uh, glitch over there. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Rajeshwari and uh, uh, the Mamta Madam uh, for having me over uh, for this event. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, so uh, departing the knowledge that I have gained in my experience of 20 plus years in the industry is a, is a pleasure. Um, I would love to do that. Thank you for having me over here. So today's topic, I think when we were having the dry run this morning, um, uh, I think Rahul asked about, you know, how, to, how about not just uh, disaggregation, could you also include something about automation? So I, I had told him that I'll go ahead and include it. So I've also included a few slides about automation and how the automation industry is turning around as it concerns with respect to network networks, not necessarily with respect to other distributed systems and how the Automation goes there, but this is more specifically focused on networks and how automation happens. So I'll cover both. Uh, today's topic uh, will cover both uh, disaggregation and as well as the network automation. Um, so without the network, nothing is possible today. And now that we are all uh, part of the COVID uh, situation and everybody working from home or being remote, uh, without networks, we, we couldn't imagine a world where we could all stay in touch and communicate and go about doing our business. Uh, for some of us in the IT industry, it's been a, not a problem at all with respect to working from home, even in the situation. And that would not have been possible without the network. So we all understand the importance of that. And 5G upcoming. So we, we have had networks for decades now. Uh, it's nothing new, but what's upcoming now new is Wi-Fi 6, which is pretty much in any office building, you know, they'll get upgraded from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6 and 5G networks. Uh, we all have seen 3G, 4G on our phones, but now 5G will give us the more bandwidth. Uh, what's driving these new trends? Let's a little bit uh, learn about that. So the Wi-Fi 6 is pretty much the enterprise play inside a building, whereas the 5G is the network that connects these two Wi-Fi endpoints. Uh, it could be coming from a home or it could be coming from an enterprise. Uh, it could also connect cities. So what are the mega trends in the networking that's driving these things? Uh, so traffic growth, uh, as we all can imagine, has exploded. All the apps on the phone, uh, everybody has a mobile phone, pretty much. It's in, uh, pretty much we can think about having every person uh, having three such handle devices, or including a computer and a phone and maybe an iPad by 2021. So every one of them requires bandwidth. And there are new services coming like IoT, right? Like Alexa and Google, um, Play, uh, Google Home. All of these things, the Nest, um, ha have new services. They are IoT devices. They, are, they demand internet. Uh, AR and VR, artificial uh, intelligence, and then this one, the video uh, applications are also requiring rapid uh, in network bandwidth. 5G, of course. And 92% of the workloads, when I talk about workloads, it's the uh, virtual uh, machine or it could be a container. Uh, they are moving to the cloud. Uh, the cloud can be here a private cloud or a public cloud or a hybrid cloud by 2020. Uh, and moreover, most of the, uh, uh, the, some of these applications are also going closer to the customer because of latency issues. And also that's called edge computing. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about that. As part of edge computing, a lot of these applications are having a sh architectural shift to move towards the late, uh, towards the uh, end user to reduce the latency and quality of services and things like that. And of course, security is very important. So these are the mega trends in the industry. So as we are all um, demand, have high growth for demand for the traffic and there are new services demanding traffic, lots of the services are moving to the cloud that requires networking. And also some of the services are moving towards closer to the customer that's called edge computing. 
And of course, all of these things, because everybody is in different, different places, we need security at the heart of it. We don't want our data to be seen by somebody else. So these are some of the mega trends in the networking that, that drives some of the architectural shifts at our service providers, whether it is in the US, AT&T, or it's in India, it's Reliance, uh, whoever, or Bharti, whoever it is, these are some of the trends that are driving our networking industry. So mass scale networking is the new normal. Going to the next one, so this requires that the network transformation is imperative, meaning we have to take the cost down. We can't keep adding more and more big switches. Yes, we have now a lot of demand. So that doesn't mean we add more routers and more switches in our networks and increase the cost of operation and also the capex. And we need to make sure that our customers are happy with less uh, uh, equipment, with more power and more capacity, more with less and less maintenance overhead with respect to automation. So they can manage the network with less number of people. So their operational expenses, the total cost of operation comes down. So, and also it helps them generate the revenue streams. So for that, the network has to transform. Uh, it has to be simple. It has to be fungible. When you look at this network block here on the left, uh, it can be disaggregated. You know, that's kind of the segue to my disaggregation story. So they want, because of the trends in the networking, trends in the industry, they want to re-architect their network, which is more open hardware from somebody, software from somebody, um, open uh, development, somebody else will develop. So those, and then uh, open uh, software to manage the network. So all of this makes their uh, life easier. So that's the kind of one of the architecture shift. Automation first, so that we instead of manually uh, managing the network, and of course, managing the life cycle. Once you install a network, you also have to upgrade the software, uh, install patches when there are issues. Um, all that life cycle of the software, life cycle of the hardware, hardware refreshes as we call it. Uh, for example, every three, four years, we have to uh, upgrade a switch. Uh, so all of this has to be open and flexible. And how do we do that? Paving the path for that network transformation. We need to simplify our, our, our switches the data plane and the control plane protocols has to be simplified. It has to be more automatable and more virtualization as it pertains. Virtualization also extends itself into software defined networking. It's part of software defined networking as well. Uh, that's also more important. You can virtualize uh, your boxes uh, on the, in the network. So that helps us create the path to the tra network transformation, which also means that we have to be more efficient, more agile and more innovative in, our, uh, in the way we design our networks and the way we design our switches. Uh, the traditional integrated solution doesn't hold good here. And also we have seen some indicators uh, in, the, in the market uh, with respect to this tornado starting 2013 till 2014, actually even now, uh, AT&T, the leading uh, uh, provider in the US um, had announced Domain Turato, where uh, they listed a white paper uh, talking about uh, asking for low cost hardware and open source software by in November 2013. Um, and I know uh, I work closely with AT&T and I know that they were asking for their 60,000 of their nodes in their network to be replaced and to have, have a disaggregated open hardware, low cost hardware and open source software in their network switches. So this is the key for your disaggregation. So this is drive is coming from the industry because they want to adapt to the high bandwidth of the uh, network. Uh, and then also I want to keep their network cost lower. So the second one is about open source routing. There are lots of uh, stacks that are there in our open source software stack that are emerging. Uh, just one second, give me one second. Um, uh, and there are a lot, uh, can you see me? Can I see my slate? Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay, so the open source routing software stack uh, is something that is also emerging. There is Quagga BGP, there is OpenR from Facebook. A lot of our web providers like Facebook, Google, uh, even for that matter, Amazon, they have developed their own protocol stack. Uh, they want their own control plane they want to manage. So this is all driving uh, where the historically, traditionally Cisco, uh, Juniper, Alcatel, you know, have been doing integrated solution, integrated boxes. But now there is a trend in the industry uh, where uh, including the old player like AT&T, not, uh, not just the old player like AT&T, but also the, also the new web players like the Facebook, the Googles of the world, the Microsoft, the Amazon, all these so-called fan companies uh, are also interested in, in making sure their data centers, their networks that they manage 
to host their applications, their cloud applications are all DSAG and open source uh, software. So they are not only stopping there, they are, they are creating, a, we have created an open OCP forum. It's called uh, Open Compute Platform Forum, where a lot of these vendors emerge, like Google is part of that, at and is part of that, Cisco is part of that. It's a forum where people talk about what should a spec for a white box look like. Uh, it should be like become a commodity, like a switch, so like a UCS server or a, any Dell server, or even I, IBM server or HP server. They all are commodity products. You can take up any Linux and load up on them and it just go boom, it works, right? So likewise, they want the switches, the data center switches or the routers to become an open platform where you can take a box, a physical hardware, which is conforming to certain standards as defined by the OCP forum and load open software, uh, which could be a routing protocol stack or an SDK and it should just work boom. And that way they can manage their cost um, and, uh, and keep it low. And are, uh, not just that this trend is happening at the uh, web companies or at the AT&Ts or at the white box uh, vendors like the CM manufacturers, but it's also happening at the lowest level, like a switch provider, like an ASIC provider, Broadcom, Marvel, all of the Intel, for example, who all manufacture these ASICs, they're also lowering, lowering their hardware costs, their chips. So the total cost of the chip becomes lower. So this becomes imperative now that for both for customers and the vendors to solve this problem. So that's the premise, um, uh, you know, segue into what's uh, this act. So this calls for creating a high-end, uh, scalable and modular networking software. So our code has to be modular. It could be data centric. It has to have open test, easy to test, and it has to have open hardware. It has to run on that. That's the premise for uh, building the uh, white boxes. So if you look at that, uh, what does hardware software disaggregation mean? A particular switch, sorry for the typo here, a particular switch component um, has an external controller, a network operating system typically, uh, it could be a uh, Juniper's operating system or a Cisco's operating system or a Arista's operating system and the hardware. Typically this, and ASIC. ASIC comes from typically what used to happen is, uh, Cisco, if I were to take consider Cisco or, or even Juniper for that matter or Alcatel, they would create their own proprietary ASIC. They would have their own hardware for the router and the data, and the data center switches and they would have their own networking software. So all of these three components that you see would be aggregated and, and provided by one vendor. Excel controller also would be provided by the same vendor. And because nobody would know how to ma uh, manage this box because this network operating system is not open, open source, or it's not very open in, people need to know the CLIs, uh, command line interface, how to configure the box, how to manage the box. So the whole thing was very proprietary and it was called an integrated solution. And it was very um, becoming, it, it, the, it was getting vendor locked for, for our customers. If they have multiple vendors um, uh, and, and all of them had their own way of managing the box and different features, it would become very difficult for them to manage. And also the cost wise, this was not uh, effective. As a result, there was this revolution about having disaggregation where the switch can come from somebody else like Broadcom. Uh, a hardware can come, come from somebody else like Edge Core, Acton, there are Delta, there are a bunch of uh, vendors that provide hardware. Uh, and then their networking software can come from people like Cisco, Juniper, Alcatel, uh, Nokia, which is the Nokia now, or, or um, Arista. An external controller can be from anybody. Uh, today, historically, Google has their own external controller. They manage their network. They want to take operating system from Cisco hardware from somewhere else and put the ASIC from somewhere else and then put them all together and create their network. In fact, Facebook has gone to the extent of creating their own operating system. That's called FBOS, Facebook OSS um, uh, operating system. And Microsoft has uh, used uh, Sonic, which is an open operating system. Uh, so they don't even want open uh, operating system from Cisco at that point or vendors. They want our hardware. They want our a a ASIC. So when I talk about disaggregation, when you disaggregate these components, Cisco could, or, or when networking vendors could only be um, selling just the hardware and the ASIC and not the OS, uh, or the networking vendor could just sell me the, be selling the OS, or network uh, or like equipment vendor could only be selling the controller. So these pieces can come from different vendors. It's the ability for the end customer to put them together is what is called as disaggregation. And the whole idea is to keep the cost low. So that's the value. Moving from transport services, integrated operations to an application infrastructure where you consider a network like a Lego. You know, it's a small building modules 
which is modular, extensible, and open, instead of one big iron here that I show, which is a closed software. So this is the transition that our customers are looking for. Open complete APIs, it's repeatable, and it has simplified feature set. So moving on. So the commodity data plane hardware looks like a pizza box. It's called a pizza box because it looks like a uh, you know, package that you, you get pizza gets delivered. Um, and it's economy of scale because the ASICs are obsolete. Uh, we, can, we have started shipping uh, high-end platforms like 100 GB. Even today, there are 400 GB. As of today, there are 400 gig uh, ports available in white boxes. Uh, people are shipping them. It's on based on J2 uh, chipsets uh, from Broadcom. Uh, people are shipping them. Uh, dis disintegration um, is here to stay. Uh, and for ease of integration, uh, no hardware, no locality, no OS assumptions is the key. And uh, we want to have large FIBs, small FIBs, doesn't matter what the requirement is. This particular white box should become a commodity hardware. It can just be a data plane. Control plane can be somewhere else and can manage it. So what does that mean? Does it bring any challenges? Hardware is from somebody. It has to be secure. That's why you have a key there and an optional software. They don't want to load all software. They want to just pick and choose certain RPMs uh, and certain uh, packages that they want. They don't want everything. So in this uh, fundamental mode of operation, um, there are a lot of challenges that come with it. How do you disaggregate? Which layer do you disaggregate? Do you disaggregate at the hardware level, at the software level? When you talk about disaggregating at the disaggregation at the software level, do you disaggregate at the BSP level? BSP stands for board support package. You just have some basic drivers and then everything else is from somebody else. Or do you disaggregate at the SDK level? SDK, when I talk about it could be like the SI, uh, it's it's more uh, P4 is from Google size and open uh, uh, switch adaptation interface. OCP also has its own open compute platform has its own adaptation layer, SDK layer, where basically the SDK, the software development uh, kit, helps you program the hardware for uh, installing your routes, installing configurations, so installing your forward information base, so the routes can happen, the switching can happen. Uh, or it could be disaggregation of the control plane only. Right, uh, OpenR is one such example from Facebook. Uh, Sonic um, is again another operating system. Entire operating system can come from a Microsoft. Or FBOS is Facebook's OSS, OS. That can come from Facebook and only hardware can come from a networking vendor. Or it could be just the protocol. They would just want Quagga BGP uh, that they want to use. Uh, so answer is all of the above. We have to disaggregate at each layer. We cannot in assume that into just the hardware and software disaggregation, but even in software, you can have disaggregation. The point about this is that disaggregation is at all levels of layers, even in software. It's not just a hardware and software disaggregation. How to quickly accommodate and customize the ODM. So all these uh, 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 ODMs is basically, um, we take the hardware from our different uh, vendor and then we give our names as in uh, a vendor, uh, the Cisco or Juniper or um, a different uh, a networking vendor will give their name to the product coming from a different um, third party. So we should be able to accommodate software uh, for hundreds of customizable pits. It, you could have different, different optic support, different speeds. Uh, all of that should be brought up with our software very quickly at different layers. Uh, it could be power supply units could be different for each of these uh, customizable uh, uh, product products. A uh, fan tray could be different, ports could be different, CPU could be different, uh, capacity of the RAM could be different, disk capacity could be different, device drivers could be different. So all of them should come up very faster, which that means we should be able to um, bring up the soft, uh, hardware very faster and turnaround time should be faster from a, uh, from a vendor perspective. And it should be with very good quality. You know, how do you create a tool change? Uh, how do you create an ISO or an RPM? Is it going to be Debian based RPM or is it, uh, it's called uh, DPKG, uh, which is the uh, Debian based packaging, or it could be an RPM, which is Red Hat based Linux packaging. So how do you deliver ONI or a Pixie boot? Uh, those kinds of things, uh, how does customer get the mob to upload the software and uh, boot the software? All of this has to be built in uh, while we are doing this disaggregation uh, because it's not traditional model. And then comes the biggest thing comes about the support. What happens if there's a network outage? What happens if there is an issue? 
Now, if you get the uh, pieces of these switches and routers coming from different vendors, then you need to figure out who is that, uh, who has the issue, who is going to be the first person going to handle all the issue. It will not be one vendor. So that becomes a problem, right? Lifecycle management, all that partnerships becomes man a problem. So I'm not saying this is something that's been solved. Not all the problems that I've listed here has been solved. How to secure this kind of boxes, right? They can be vulnerable. Does it have a Kiro chip? Does it have an Act 2 chip to make sure there's no tampering happening at the hardware level? What about software? If somebody uh, manipulates your software, uh, do you have a checksum uh, and hashing ability to make sure your software is not hampered with? So because you're now loading your software on a third party hardware, which you didn't test with in your in-house. So all of these things needs to be handled. So, so at least for the most part, the troubleshooting, lifecycle management, how to secure, I think is still work in progress, but for the most part, how to disaggregate and how to maintain quality has been solved. So it is, it is a challenge. Uh, it's not fully solved and it is critical. So these are some of the things that we have to do. So hopefully uh, that kind of concludes my uh, thoughts about where we are with respect to, uh, in terms of uh, in our journey, uh, with respect to the software disaggregation uh, and where the industry is headed and how it was being driven by different uh, vendors uh, from grassroots level and also vendors and customers alike and how it's here to stay and how everybody's working to the, together, uh, both from the vendors and the customers to solve this problem and solve and, and make it a reality. Uh, and it's already, uh, most of these vendors have delivered in one shape or the form and live traffic has been carried over these disaggregated boxes in major customers already. So it's, it's still, it's in its infancy. However, it's here to stay. It is going to be one of the major drivers to keep the cost low. Now, uh, related to that, once you are talking about the cost low, automation is the key. Uh, automation is the very, very important factor in making sure your network operations, for, uh, like for the big wigs like Bharati B, uh, and Geo or I mean, Re Reliance or whoever is the vendor, uh, right, uh, customer that is providing these network services is able to keep their cost low. Uh, for that, automation is the key. So. The challenges today of managing these networks today at scale is each of these uh, providers, uh, service providers, I would call them, have 20 plus network device roles in their network from access to aggregation to um, edge to core to a um, lot of the data center edge, data center leave, data center uh, roles like um, um, uh, 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 leaf and root, all those nodes will have different, different devices, roles, different, different uh, abilities and different requirements. And at any point in time, you may have 4 million lines of configuration files. And just imagine, it's not the software I'm talking about here. The scale is too high and 4 million lines of configuration files. There may be more than half a dozen vendors. They may have at least three or four vendors in their network and different platforms. There could be a distributed platform. There could be a fixed platform. When I say distributed platform, it's like a huge chassis uh, with a controller and with a bunch of line cards and shelf controller and fabric cards and such. And, or it could be a single, like a pizza box, simple switch. And there could be changes of these configurations every month, many tools and multiple generations of software. And it takes a mammoth of army to manage this network. And there goes your OPEX, right? It's high. So management plane is way behind. All of these vendors have their own switches, have their own proprietary CLIs, lot of scripts, incremental configuration. There is no standard way to configure a box. Uh, SNMP monitoring is not simple, although SNMP is standard. Uh, configuration scrap change becomes a nightmare. So what's the solution there? Model-based automation. So where it is open again, open, 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 uh, meaning everybody uses the same standard. Uh, it's durable APIs for managing and monitoring the network. Um, management abstraction layer, it's insulated from lower level details. It's NOS agnostic, meaning it is network operating system agnostic. So all the models, which is kind of the Yang models, uh, which is the uh, IETF based Yang models are there. There is open config Yang models are there. Even if it is uh, native Yang models, they are the ones that are more standard and customers can manage that as opposed to CLIs. Even especially when managing uh, multiple uh, vendors in their network, like if they have more than three vendors boxes in their network, if I am AT&T or if I am Reliance and I have boxes from 
um, Arista, Juniper, and let's say um, Huawei. All of them are managed uh, differently. All of them are configured differently. But if I have open config models, uh, Yang models, then it becomes easier to manage them and I can write layers on top of them. So it becomes a contract. So this is the same thing that I mentioned, which is more in a pictorial way. So what used to happen earlier, as you can see uh, from the left side of this picture, uh, this is called EMS stands for element management system. This is for vendor A and you may have some tools for vendor B, you may have another management system from vendor C. Vendor A provides its own switch and its own management system. Vendor C provides its own switch and its own management system. Vendor B provides its own switch, but does not provide any management sta uh, station. So then customer has to go ahead and write some tools around it. And if you want to change anything, now you have multiple things to manage from a customer perspective. So they used to create something called common OSS. It's kind of the northbound uh, application written on top of uh, EMSs. Uh, again, every time the southbound interface changed, they have to manage their application and change their operators uh, uh, NMS, network management system. That again is a problem. So what's the solution for that? It is the common management model. So I don't have to worry about EMS A, EMS B, EMS C. Instead, I'll have a common management model, which is the Yang model. And on top of that, I create a network management system that then becomes, uh, it has a native support for all vendors. Then I don't have to worry about this interface changing too much. Then my operations cost comes down because then I don't need to employ as many people to manage this application. So hopefully that kind of gives you the picture of what the ch challenge is with respect to managing different boxes and how automation helps. So when we talk about model-driven network management, there are two parts to it. One is config, the other one is telemetry. So topology is something key. So when the network devices are connected to each other, we need to know which router or a switch is connected to which interface of another router or a switch. This topology discovery through these uh, routes that comes out of the boxes is a key. Um, telemetry helps do that. Uh, there are uh, rib routes, fib routes that we can telemetry. We can telemetry basically send it from the box to the network element station, network management station, and that helps it to discover the topology and also configurations through models, like using standard common modeling language called Yang. Um, and I forgot this, uh, what Yang stands for right now, the expansion. Um, it's mostly data encodings is standard encodings like Google's protobuf or XML or JSON. Um, these are some of the standard encodings that this particular language will carry so anybody can understand. Uh, so we don't, it's not vendor specific. Likewise, the telemetry is also using encoding of JSON uh, using uh, exploring the Yang, but then the telemetry is pretty much JSON. So people uh, as in the NMS, when it gets these data from the devices and the switches and the data center, it can decode and understand what happens. Now suddenly boom, you know, you have one language to talk to whether it is a switch or a router or a data center switch. So one uh, way to communicate back and forth and makes things easier from a network management perspective. So um, we want absolute, this, this calls for absoluting uh, telemetry, I'm sorry, SNMP from our network. Uh, Google has done this for a fact. Google uses gRPC called Google RPC, uh, remote procedure call. I, I'm guessing you guys have studied RPCs uh, in your networking class, uh, root, uh, remote procedure call. Google has its own standard on top of that called gRPC, which is the standard, which is more secure and efficient. So they use gRPC to, as a transport uh, to send all these time series stream, data stream. As you can see, these are all time-based streams coming from a switch and a router. If there is an issue happens, there is an asynchronous event going from the box. And constantly it will send what are the routes, what are the configurations happening, what are the stats on the routers, what are my counters looking like, is there any problem that I'm seeing. So all of that will help the telemetry collectors at the network level uh, to look at the models coming from the boxes and uh, correlate them and create some analytics around it and maybe even create some self-healing remediation so that we can fix the network problems. So this is the key, and this is where the lot of innovation is happening today uh, to help our customers. So that brings us a good segue to different journey in automation. What was the tribal knowledge, original predated historic network automation where we talk about the silos uh, here um, in this picture. 
This is the historic pre-vendor tools, right? From there, the journey was tribal, tribal knowledge. Uh, it's very specific to a customers, separate data, data silos. It's all manual, you know, traditional network management. From there, we come to the next level where you have network automation. You automate as needed. It's open source, do it yourself and SDK and best effort support. The North Star for this journey in the automation is the one that's in orange color here, where the whole operations itself is getting transformed. You can automate pretty much anything. Intent-based model and model-based configuration, machine learning is incorporated into this whole thing. Health insights, you can get the health of the network or an individual box in the network. Uh, uh, sorry, it's not self, it's self-healing. Uh, there's a mistake there, it's self-healing. It's cloud delivered. This application can be in a cloud. It doesn't have to be on-prem uh, where the network is. So you can have a cloud uh, manage these multiple of these networks. And it's open APIs for developers. Developers can enhance these cloud delivered NMS as well by adding their own applications on top, uh, like feature telemetry and things like that. So this is where makes it much easier for customers now to manage the network, as you can see, right? So now you don't use CLIs, you use models, you use machine learning to see how the network is behaving. You have the health insights. You can do self-healing, uh, predict the issue and do a self-healing and it's cloud and easy to manage. And it's all open API and anybody can develop. That's where the journey of automation is headed. And I don't think it's fully there yet. It's all um, cutting edge technology. Uh, things are in, some of it is deployed, some of it is not deployed in the industry fully. It again depends on the vendors and the, uh, and the service providers. Uh, some service providers are bold enough and are halfway there, some are not. But this is where the breakthrough is happening in the industry. Um, so to think about this particular uh, solution, this in this orange box, what does what components does that orange box have to deliver all of these things? Intent-based uh, configuration, model-based configuration, machine learning, health insights. To deliver all of that, what should a component look like to deliver this end-to-end -end automation solution, which is a self-healing network? You need to have an ability to configure the box, collect the telemetry from the box, curate that telemetry and see if there is anything problem there and remediate or, or optimize and analyze the data that's coming in, create analytics out of it. Maybe that will help reduce your mean time to resolution and mean time to uh, KPI uh, indices uh, quality deduction and correlate all of them. This all defines about data science, right? Data science uh, using ML uh, APIs, AMR, uh, all of these things, machine reasoning and both machine learning. All of that are used at the higher stack level to look at the health of the network and correlate and predict, oh, I'm seeing these set of events. I'm seeing an interface flap. I'm seeing a route go down. I'm seeing a congestion in the network. How can I control this congestion? I can predict this congestion happening because the quality of service, the buffers are, VOQ buffers are getting filled up. And maybe there's a use case there. The bunch of use cases that this can solve, not just about, uh, when I talk about correlation, I just want to give some example like uh, network bandwidth congestion. How do you predict that? Is it, is it time of day? Because early morning or during the day, during the night, maybe there's no congestion. This also helps our customers how to configure their network, how much of bandwidth to configure in their network and save the conserve the bandwidth. Maybe during the daytime, they need more bandwidth. During the night, they don't need. So time of day type of statistics and analytics. And also the peak time of the traffic, You know, um, depending on where you are in the network, you may have to configure the traffic bandwidth and also um, reduce the congestion. Uh, so you can manage your VOQs um, uh, and quality of services as well. Uh, if the interface flap happens, what could be happening in the network? How do I fix the network? All of these things is driven by the intelligent automation solution, which is basically driven by ML and MR. And that's where industry is headed. It's not just about configuring the box, but also getting the information from the box and using that to help manage the network in a more effective, efficient, in an agile way, uh, which, which doesn't require a huge army of people and a lot of equipment uh, to manage this, a lot of software to manage this, and thus reducing the cost for our customers. So this is where data science meets the network operations excellence. Self-healing, uh, always optimized, and always on networks. If you want to have them, then you know data science is one way to get there. Uh, automate both manual and any repetitive tasks, adapt and quickly uh, constantly change the service requirements. 
So data science, we have known uh, for decades now, the networking technologies and intelligence, L2, L3, optics, you know, data center technologies. We have expertise in our access edge networks, aggregation, core and transport and data center. But data science now meets these networks, uh, always on networks. And also data analytics, machine learning, uh, network-based anomaly detection, multivariant analysis, complex multi-technology data and correlation of them, analyzing them and visualization of that. Um, all these application performance management uh, is a key these days. Uh, there are a lot of, um, and for, as a matter of fact, Cisco has bought recently some company called Thousand Eyes, which was basically an APM company called um, application performance management company. Even in the past, uh, we have bought uh, companies like uh, AppDynamics. All of these companies are become very um, uh, crucial uh, and front and center these days and very hot uh, in terms of data analytics. It doesn't have to be a service provider network. It could be an enterprise network. The same data science, the same data analytics and same automation can apply to an enterprise network to manage your own enterprise. It could be a BMS's own enterprise network that you have. You want to manage your network to see how many people are logging in, when they are logging in, when they are logging out, what kind of applications they're accessing. Are they being secure? Are they, is there anything wrong happening in the network? All of these things, the IT security, all of this can be run through analytics. Uh, they're all automation end of the day. Uh, and automation is delivered as an SDK, right? It's a delimitary toolkit and people can develop on top of that. It will have an exposed and open APIs um, uh, with cloud native principles and people can develop applications on top of them. So this is rapidly, helps in rapidly innovating and deploying more automated outcomes. Because as a vendor, you would have deployed certain use cases, uh, for example, but then you could not have thought of all the use cases. There could be more use cases. When you uh, make your SDK, automation SDK open, people can ride on and create more use cases on top of that. And that's extremely powerful. So this makes it for a very co compelling use case in the field. So the same thing that I've said so far, it's more uh, represented here in a pictorial way how the networks and the automations come together. This is the bottom picture here is a network where you are using your uh, controller to configure and get the real time telemetry and use the telemetry based on your KPIs. KPI stands for key performance indices. Consider, think of that like a metrics, you know, what makes sense? What is okay in a network? What's not okay in a network? What should be the uptime in a network? What should be the uh, speed in a network, latency in a network? You might have, certain metrics that you want to monitor and manage, and you see how they are holding up. If they are not, you can have an alert system, like PagerDuty is one such application. You can integrate to that to a PagerDuty, which can, autom which can automatically send a notification to a person, a human being who can go and take an action on the network, which means that you don't need one person sitting in front of the computer monitoring the screen 24 by seven. It can happen automatically. Or it could also be used this data to a predictive engine using MLMR make, uh, may can expose a potential uh, uh, you know, downtime or a potential uh, black hole or a potential gray hole in the network. Uh, um, network may be degrading, network may be uh, having a lot of problems in the network or there may be a security breach uh, could be potential. So all of that can be predicted uh, by this predictive engine and it can uh, go back and take automated uh, action on the network. And all of this data can be saved in a data lake uh, for later um, more analytics uh, done, uh, or it can be sent to data warehousing from data lake to do data warehousing and then see historically what has happened. Where all we have seen this issue, which customer seems to have more issues like this, or is it specific networks have a problem, or is it specific cities have a problem, or a specific country seems to have this problem of breach, what could be going on there? How can we help fix that? So this gives a lot of intelligence and use cases to help fix the problem and automate the whole thing. So this automation together with network is a compelling story on how we can fix it. So coming to my conclusion, so what that does that mean? There is a tremendous focus on reducing total cost of operation. Uh, hence the trend is towards disaggregation and closed loop automation. What I mean by closed loop automation is it's not just automating to configure, but it's also to get the data back from the network and use that to go back and re-optimize your network, right? It's closed loop, uh, completely closed loop. So closed loop automation is the key. Reducing the cost of services creation is important, whether you're creating an L2 service, L3 service, 
uh, just a control plane, um, maybe even an NFE, you know, for example, this could even be an SDN network where you have only the data plane here, all the control plane may be in the network management station, like a control, like a BGP or running on the network management station. Even then reducing the, the path computation engine could be in the uh, network management station because in a true SDN, that's what happens. So reducing the cost of service is uh, create service creation is important. So closed loop automation and self remediation and model based config and telemetry is the key. So what does that mean? The network equipment software and hardware design is influenced now by distributed software architecture, distributed multi-level architecture, like more leaf and spine architecture. Um, and then also smaller pits, smaller pizza boxes, not huge switches or a multi-chassis, which used to be the case in the earlier architectures where we used to have multi-chassis, huge chassis. It can be now smaller switches, uh, multi-level architecture, spine and leaf architecture, like you would see in a data center. And it's microservices based. Your software on the switch can be microservices. You can put a software, remove a software, an RPM package. So it's all optional packages on the software. Running on commodity hardware, it should be open development and open test so that anybody can easily test with open APIs that you provide. And it should support NFE and SDN as well. So this is where the network is headed and uh, with respect to disaggregation and with respect to automation. So with that, I think I come to the end of my presentation and um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Mr. Rahul? Rahul? Uh, yes, ma'am, here. Uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, uh, when you, when Sushma, uh, ma'am, had uh, mentioned about the common management where you can manage from, uh, like, you can manage, uh, like, multiple vendors, does it mean that each management or, like, each vendor should have a common, uh, let's say, uh, like, their OS can be, uh, like, a Linux-based uh, or something, uh, how can how 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 is this problem? I mean, how how can this be solved? Like from a common management module, like for say example, like uh, we say uh, Cisco has its own OS, uh, Cisco IOS, which is proprietary, and it's not open source. And Juniper has its own OS, Juniper OS. So uh, how do how how is a common management model ca uh, which can be supported all these vendors? Sure, it's a good question. So. That is through this Yang models. It's called a common modeling language that you use. Similar, to, think of it like an SNMP plus, 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 plus. If you guys have heard of SNMP, simple network management protocol, you try to OID and you use the OID to configure the boxes and the protocol packet format is standard. Anybody can understand that. Likewise, Yang has a way of defining a particular model. Like you, it is a language. It will tell you what's the key, what's the length, what's the variable. It's based on tag and attribute. It will say what the tag is and the tags are all pretty standard and then it have a value. So anybody can decode that as long as they implement the Yang model, they can implement that. And these Yang models are also defined by two standard bodies, IETF for one, uh, and then the second one is open config. Um, so all of these guys and IEEE also has some models, I guess. So all of them define the models and our own networking vendors also have their own models. So the models are something uh, very uh, easily encoded using protobuf, which is a standard Google protobuf or XML encoding and JSON. So it's easy to write compilers. There are tool chains available out there for people to use that. When I'm sending data from the box, whether it's in telemetry or when I'm configuring, when I'm sending these things, people can use them, uh, decode them or encode them and understand what's happening. So that's what this common management model helps. So when they write the NMS on top, they don't need to worry about different CLIs uh, being done by these different vendors, which they don't even understand. They don't want to use CLIs. Uh, thank Did you, ma'am. Can I answer your question, Rahul? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is answered. And ma'am, uh, we have some doubts on telemetry and open dev. Can you please uh, speak on that, ma'am? Okay. So telemetry is nothing but um, a time series of data. Maybe I should go here and explain. It's called streaming telemetry, meaning the device in question will start sending data about, it's called opera data, uh, without complicating too much. Let's say a switch has uh, stats. I'm having an interface, my interface counter. 
is going up and down or my packets are getting dropped or my packets are, I'm supposed to get a packet from on one interface. I'm supposed to send it out on another interface. That's what the router does, right? Uh, but then let's say I'm getting a packet on one interface, but I'm not able to send it out. It's getting dropped because I'm congested within my uh, CPU and my NPU or because my routes are not configured properly. I don't know where the destination is. So I'm dropping the packets. So my drop packet counter goes up, right? That needs to be notified. It's a problem. Somebody has to debug that. That's one such attribute. Or my interface is flapping, uh, like it's going up and down, up and down. It should be constantly up. It's going up and down. Or there could be some alarms uh, in the system. Or my buffers are getting filled up. There are a lot of these device-specific information, which is not really configured, but it's more a real state of the device, so to speak, state of the hardware, state of the software. Uh, that needs to be sent to a telemetry collector through telemetry. Telemetry is nothing but it's a meterized information from the box going to the collectors, which will tell how the device is doing, what if there any issue. So when the telemetry collector gets it, it can send it back to the upstream application here on top for further correlation to see if everything is okay as expected by the KPI. So the telemetry is nothing but comes from uh, the, it's, your people can, I mean, I say people, I should not say people, it's this, uh, the telemetry collector subscribe, right? They, they subscribe to these devices saying, I'm interested in these things. For example, you subscribe to certain news channels, certain podcast. You don't want, there are so many news channels and podcasts out there. You don't want everyone. You just want to subscribe to certain things just like that. You can subscribe to certain events and certain parameters on the boxes and say, okay, I want only this level, or I, it can be even regex based. You know, I want everything that happens on this interface, or I want everything that happens on this line card, or I want everything that happens on this particular MPU. Send me the data, or I'm only interested in this particular port. I don't want to hear about, know about the whole uh, switch. So like that, you can subscribe to the level of granularity you want, and then it'll start streaming the data about that device. Sometimes they won't even stream the packets um, uh, that we are getting, if there are getting drop packets, what is the drop packet? They want to see the drop packet so that they can analyze why the packet was dropped. Is it, or if there a security breach, they want to draw, uh, get that data as to who is the one who is doing denial of service attack, those kinds of things, or it could be a net flow. You want to send a net flow information to see how traffic is getting on. So there's on and on. These are all time series data that goes into this telemetry collectors. So hopefully that answers. It basically is one way direction as you can see from the device to the northbound management station. Uh, thank you ma'am, I hope that answers the question. Uh, and uh, can you please explain about open dev? Uh, we had a question on that. Where did I talk about open dev? Yeah, okay. So when I say open dev, um, I think I might have had it in one of these automation values here, I guess. Um, yeah. I think I talked about this disruption, open outcome driven platform enablement. Um, when you have so many of these things happening, if you make your network management station open APIs, people can develop on top of this network management station applications and use cases. You might have infrastructure available to correlate things to data lake, uh, to create metrics to alert when there's a health issue, but there could be, you cannot potentially see all use cases out there. You might have created this platform for about five use cases, for about maybe 10, but you might not have created everything for all use cases. For all those use cases, customers can build customized metrics on top of what you have and then develop applications on top of it. The easiest way I can give an analogy is think of, um, you all probably have you know, used iPhone. iPhone has app store. You can create, anybody can create an app for an app store. App Store, think of App Store as an infrastructure or Google Play as an infrastructure where anybody, any developer, they give an open SDK and an API that you can uh, create an app on, on top of App Store or a Google Play and then host it uh, for a fee. So that's what is called as an open API where you can create an API, it's an SDK, it tells you what APIs to use, how you can host an application on an App Store or in, in this matter, an automation engine. So people can write their own use cases, create their own metrics and develop on top of that. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, that's a good answer. Okay. Any more questions, Rahul? Uh, 
Uh, right now, we don't see any more questions, ma'am. Uh, I think that's the that's it, ma'am. Okay. 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 Then uh, shall we conclude this question and answer session? Yeah, Rahul. Rahul. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think we can. Uh, uh, yes. I think we can uh, end this Q and A section, ma'am. We don't yes. see any more questions yeah. popping. Thank you. Thank you for some uh, Rahul for summarizing all the questions and uh, Sushma has answered it very well. And I could see our principal sir, uh, Dr. Shikanta Murthy K and our VP, Dr. Harisha P. Throughout the sessions, they were there. So on behalf of everyone, uh, I request our uh, beloved principal sir to share his. Uh, views on this session in one or two sentences uh, may I have our principal sir dr shikanta murthy ke here sir hello yes sir yes sir hello yes yeah, sir madam yes sir your views on this session sir hello yes yes audible sir ha uh, tell me yeah one or two sentences about this session sir your feedback yeah uh yeah. good morning everybody it was a wonderful session we had a, a lot of uh, things to learn. i mean we a lot of things to be noted here and uh, uh, the presentation was uh, very nice madam thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, giving us uh, enlightening talk on this uh, uh, beautiful topic and also i came to know from uh, mamtha madam you are an alumni of uh, the national institute of engineering mysore happens to be i am also from nie so yes it was good uh, i don't know whether i have seen you or not uh, but anyway uh, it was nice to meet you in this occasion and uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, session uh, thank you very much yeah. it's my pleasure sir Yes, I'm from NIE, and I, in fact, I'm classmate of uh, uh, Rajeshwari. So we went together. Oh, we okay, worked together okay, in the fine. same batch, and uh, it's an uh, it's an honor. Thank you for having me, and I had a good pleasure of uh, uh, talking to you all. Madam, you're from computer science branch, and hopefully people found this useful. Madam, you're computer science branch from NIE, or no, no, electronics and telecommunication. Oh, I am from electrical and electronics. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which batch? A ninety-three. Oh, ninety-three. I think uh, that Ramana Chari lover you are head of. Actually, no. Ah, uh, Ramana uh, Rajeshwari, do you remember? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, at the time he was actually. Ah, Shivram. 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 Shivram, sir, Doctor H. Shivram. Oh, H. Shivram. Shivram. Okay, that. Yeah, uh, I think it was somebody. Yeah, used to I, have. I, I don't uh, remember. I'm so bad about this. Yeah, H. <laughs> Shivram. I know. I know. Yeah, he used yeah. to take uh, for us uh, analog computers. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shrikanta, I think. Shrikanta, right? Shrikanta was our. Shrikanta was also there. He was taking uh, digital yes. electronics and other things. Right. Hmm. Yeah, but uh, Shivram was taking analog computers. We uh, Raja Raman textbook. Correct. Uh, I remember Asha, JP, who were the. Ah, uh, Asha Lata, JP, Asha Lata is. Uh, yeah, Kumar. I met her in uh, PES also. She went. Uh, you know, she's in. I see. Yeah, yeah. Boch Kumar and also. Uh, ah, uh, yeah, Boch yeah, Kumar yeah. was my teacher for microprocessor. Same for us. I think he was our yeah. teacher for microprocessors. Yes, yes. Okay, it was good. Good talking to you all. Nice work, madam. Yes, you yes. Yeah, keep in touch. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Formally, I will be ending this session now. Um, uh, today it was a great day for us because uh, all the students they will think that network is very tough subject. Since uh, Sushma is having a very great knowledge in this subject, she has given very uh, light way of the presentation. That means for all the participants, they took it in a positive way. They can change their mindset, thinking that even network is also very easy subject. Uh, and lot of opportunities are there in networking field. Even their specialization as networking. So I am very much thankful for uh, Ms. Sushma uh, for this uh, 
wonderful uh, webinar today lot of participants were there i think it is great useful for each and every one once again i thank ms sushma on behalf of uh, bms management and uh, nagarjuna management thank you sushma for being here thank you and i would like to thank bms team and management and the nagarjuna team and management dr shri gopala krishna sir for accepting this webinar and guided us initially and dr shrikantha murthy k our beloved principal uh, who has given wonderful feedback about this presentation and dr harisha p uh, who really supported us this webinar i am thankful to both the management next again same dr rajeshwari hegade i am very much thankful to her because uh, uh, she has introduced me a great resource person who is having great in deep knowledge about uh, networking thank you rajeshwari hegade for initiating this uh, uh, workshop i am thankful to you rajeshwari hegade and uh, mr rahul and mr pereswami who are behind this and uh, who had uh, really worked for this uh, 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 webinar i am thankful to each and everyone once again i hope uh, everyone will be uh, taking forward this uh, webinar thank you once again each and everyone thank you have a great time stay safe okay thank you bye thank you thank you bye mamta bye. madam yeah good night to sushma yeah <laughs> good no, yes sir uh, not nothing around 300 plus were there in uh, youtube madam this is benefited a lot yes sir a lot Yes 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 sir yes sir okay, okay. thank you bye -bye. everyone have a great time bye rajeshwar egade once again thank you mamta mamta okay